Thank you, Mr. Fraud Mooring, and thank you for your patience. Uh, continuing on with the first session, I would now like to invite again Dr. Yusuf Al Hassan and our speaker in this session, um, Bhai Sahib Bhai Mahinder Singh Aluwalia Ji. Please give them a big round of applause. Dr. Yusuf Al Hassan, our moderator for this session. Distinguished participants, esteemed brothers and sisters, allow me to salute you in the traditional Sikh way. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. If there are 300 people here, there are 300 sparks, divine sparks. That's what humans are. We are sparks of the divine. Prayer. is a divine nuclear power. What is prayer? You open up your heart and send an email to God Almighty. God help, because He is the Creator, the most merciful, the most forgiving. His outreach is infinite. He is in everyone. He is here. He is out there. He is everywhere. So send him a prayer. The email is not difficult. It is love.com, forgiveness.com. It is humility.com. It is forgiveness.com. Those are the emails. Send it to him, the creator, our master creator, our heavenly father, mother, brother, sister, protector, all in one. We started the session with a prayer, beautiful prayer. I could not understand, but I could resonate because it was a prayer. And all prayers we must resonate with. We have sick prayers. Sab me jot jot hai soye tis de chanan sab me chanan hoye. Awal Allah noor upaya kudrat ke sab bande ek noor te sab jag upjaya kon pale ko mande. All of us, where have we come from? The three cardinal questions. What are our origins? What are our roots? What is our goal? What is our destination? And what are we here to do? Three cardinal questions each must answer. And that's very simple. We got detached from God and we'll ultimate merge with God. So it is very easy. Our root and our goal is the same. So what are we here for? To create peace, to love each other. We have a golden opportunity to try and endeavor, take steps to meet up with God. That is the reason why we are here. It is particularly pleasing and heartwarming that interfaith harmony is being celebrated in Dubai. I am deeply humbled to be part of it. There have been major attempts over two millennia, over 2,000 years in the context of interfaith, signifying the importance of being firmly grounded within one's own faith, yet having to respect other faiths. It is said to be religious in the 21st century is to be interreligious. It is within this context that I would like to share with you 
the importance attached to interfaith dialogue within my dharm, my religion, my faith. And this is all to do with efforts for peace and harmony. Between 1497 and 1521, the founder of the Sikh Dharam, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, went on a remarkable interfaith journey of dialogue within people of other faiths, lasting some 23 years in total. He traveled roughly over 20, 27,000 kilometers, almost exclusively on foot. That equates to an average of over three kilometers a day, every day for 23 years. Where did he go? Why did he go? What was he doing? Well, he was engaging in dialogue with, sits in, with the Siddhs in the Himalayan mountains and people of other faiths. Records show he went as far east as Dhaka, as far west as Mecca and Baghdad, north into Tibet and south to Sri Lanka. He traveled mostly with two faithful companions, by Mardana, a Muslim musician, and by Balaji, a Hindu devotee. Throughout these journeys, neither knowing where he would spend the night nor where he would eat, Guru Nanak spread the message of oneness of God to all, regardless of faith or background of those he encountered. He stressed the need to live in world, inspired by a sense of loving duty towards not just the Creator, but towards the whole of creation. His teachings were expressed in lyrical verse, urging us to live up to those qualities latent within us that make us all in the image of God. Such as love, compassion, forgiveness, truth, selflessness. These verses form the foundation of Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the eternal Sikh Guru, comprising of hymns from Guru Nanak Dev Ji and five subsequent nine Gurus, as well as Hindus and Muslim saints. It is a unique model of interfaith, our sacred text. The example of Guru Nanak Dev Ji's travels and our interfaith scripture are but two elements of the dharam that compel Sikhs to embrace interreligious dialogue. The fifth Guru, Guru Arjan Dev Ji, had the foundation stone of the Sikh's most sacred shrine, Sri Harmandar Sahib, also known as the Golden Temple, laid by Muslim Saint Sai Mia Mir. The foundation of the most holy place of the Sikhs was laid by a Muslim. Sai Mia Mir, and upon being tortured by Muslims, stated that he did not harbor hate for those who were torturing him. In fact, nobody was alien to him or his enemy. He, his torture, he stated, was within God's will. The ninth Guru, Guru Teikh Bahadur Ji, made the supreme sacrifice, giving his life to protect the freedom of religious belief and practice of the Hindu faith, a faith other than his own. So we find people talk about tolerance. After tolerance comes acceptance. After acceptance comes respect. And after respect comes sacrifice for the other. Har ka naam ride nitityayi. We are required not to exalt ourselves, to elevate ourselves, but to do that with everybody that we come across. Those who are our companions. We are required to do that. We are bound, duty bound. Now I'm reading from writings of our 10th Guru. Ko bhayo mundiya sanyasi, ko jogi bhayo, ko brahmachari, ko jati anmanbo. Manas ki jat sabbe ek hi pehchanbo. The whole of humankind is one family. And every Sikh prayer, Sikh means somebody who is a learner, Sikhna. So we are lifelong learners. And every Sikh prayer in home, in the Guru Dwara, wherever, ends with a prayer invoking blessings for all humankind. 
sarbat da phala thus whilst highly distinct as a faith or dharm the sikh dharm holds a profound spirit and ethos of universality at its core peace in the home there are two distinct homes one that we all recognize and live in that is made of bricks and mortar or mud and thatch this is the worldly home and very much part of the physical realm there is another home associated with the spiritual realm that is located within us it is our hrda it is only from this spiritual home that one can begin to resolve one's spiritual and temporal affairs there is of course a resonance between these two homes and clearly one needs to have peace within both homes to influence and promote peace throughout the world peace within our inner self is a prerequisite to fostering peace outside again i quote from guru granth sahib ji kar sukh vasya bahar sukh paya koh nanak gur mantar dadaya translations are a very poor substitute of the original at best they dilute the meaning at worst they distort the meaning so praise should be said in the original text thir kar baiso har jan pyare sat gur tumre kaaj sware again we are talking about the internal home ghar hi mein amrit parpur hai man mukha sadhna aaya the home within is filled with ambrosial nectar but the self centered manmukh does not get to taste it he is like a deer who does not recognize its own musk scent so how are we going to obtain peace achieve peace first practice dharm for establishment of peace dharm religion or faith should strictly be synonymous with peace and harmony it must promote conflict resolution and forgiveness compassion mercy and righteousness i quote now from our sacred scripture and this is attributed to a muslim saint kabir what does he say kabir jahan gyan tahan dharm hai where there is wisdom there is religion jahan gyan tahan dharm hai jahan chhoot tahan paap where there is deceit and there are lies there is sin jahan lob tahan kaal hai where there is greed there is famine death and destruction and jahan khima taha aap and where there is forgiveness there is god himself so we talk about mercy and forgiveness the shortest way to get to god is to forgive people so i am working on a charter for forgiveness and reconciliation so we need to practice dharm individually collectively and so on the world dharm you find academics will be using sikhism buddhism communism these are not isms this is dharm this is faith this is religion and they will be there until the stars and the moons are there so they are not isms the word dharm literally means to hold on to ethics values and virtues good discipline and righteous conduct it is the inherent characteristic virtue of which it exists every object has its own dharmic properties with which it is defined water is always liquid it is its dharm gentleness is the dharm of flowers being hot is the dharm of fire solid and hard is the dharm of stone being good is the dharm of humans the dharms faiths and religions should nurture good human beings that's their primary function k 
capable of exercising compassion, mercy, forgiveness, truthfulness, selflessness, humility, and most of all, love. Saach kahon sun layo sabay, jin prem kiyo ten hi prapayo. If you want to meet up with God, you will have to love God. But to love God, you will have to love all creation. Values, virtues are important. Even before a child is born, now this is very significant. The nine months of pregnancy are vital. Because it is during this period that the foundation of the mental state of the future adult is laid. Of course, the process of nurturing within a loving environment continues throughout one's life. So mothers have a great role to play. If the mother is stressed, the unborn child is stressed. If he will live 90 years, that's the foundation being laid. So it is important to understand, we cannot give grief to mothers who are expecting. That's where education begins. So the husband has a responsibility to see he doesn't give grief to his dear wife. Another key element for creating most conducive condition for peace is the strengthening and stabilizing of the sacred institution of marriage. It breaks my heart, I come from UK. A population of 60 million, nine million single parents, two thirds are divorcees, fighting in the courts about the state, swearing at each other. And these children, where will they learn values. So strengthening of this institution, sacred institution of marriage is vital for peace building. There needs to be, there needs to be cohesion within the family, community and society. Equipped with, armed with values and virtues, the human being is less likely to become intolerant of diversity or to engage in acts detrimental to the fostering of peace. The role of youth in building peaceful homes and communities. We have to empower youth. In 2007, there was a UNICEF report that we have a failed generation in England. It was a wake up call. Why there is a failed generation? Well, we adults were not giving kids values and virtues. Nobody teaches them at school humility, compassion, forgiveness, truthfulness, contentment. No, we don't teach that. So we have a failed generation. And we set up. It was a wake up call. We came with 24 moral and spiritual dispositions for the RE syllabus in Birmingham. So we have to empower youth with values and virtues. A home where faith is practiced and where mutual respect and love between parents and children is exercised using values and virtues becomes a peaceful home. It is a fact of life that we do not choose our dharma. I am a Sikh not because of my choice. God Almighty who doesn't blunder put me in a Sikh faith. My duty is to become a good Sikh. Somebody is born in a Muslim faith. It is not his or her choice. They have to be good Muslims. And so it goes on. Similarly, we do not choose our parents. I don't go and choose my mom. I do not go and choose my dad. God chooses them for me. He doesn't blunder. Respect children. Children must respect parents. That's very, very important. Even if the parents misbehave, the children have no right to accuse parents. God will ask them. There is rich legacy of wisdom 
encapsulated within religious sacred texts. So youth needs to be a so youth needs to abundantly draw from these to become wise and humble. How do you become wise? You can have 20 PhDs, you will have intellect. Thank you. But you may not be wise. It is prayer that makes you wise and it is service that makes you humble. So we have to be careful how we become wise and humble. In order to promote peace in the world, one has to begin with oneself, to restore peace and order within. There are 7.4 billion people in this world today. Not two are alike. Look at the infinite diversity of God. Not two people are alike. I can have millions of people better than anybody and millions lesser than anybody, but I cannot have one of you. Because that is God, it's infinite wisdom. The mind is an immensely powerful tool with the capacity to be either one's best friend or indeed one's worst enemy. So it is the mind that is important. We have to learn a lesson from the past, bury the past, reconcile and forgive to have peace. The separation of church and the state has divided humanity into two camps. We have to come together. Secularity and spirituality must fuse together for the common good. Responsibility is a precursor to rights. Not many people will know that people had formulated a universal declaration of responsibilities. It took many years from 1983 to 97, but it did not come up. I think we need to look into this. We have to revisit this responsibilities declaration. Empowering of humans with virtues is a necessary precursor to changing mindsets transforming attitudes and bringing about a new planetary consciousness. We are living in a global village. Each one is affecting everybody else. I will have to stop here by concluding that through his grace and wisdom, God Almighty has lovingly bequeathed Peace to the whole of creation within the realms of matter, vegetation, animals, and us, his children. There is natural divine peace and harmony. We must endeavor to understand it. Humans who are the most evolved of species on this planet have a free will and have reasoning power. We should expect Nothing less than peace and tranquility and harmony within our homes, our families, communities and societies, nationally and internationally. Thank you.